Hey there, and thank you for joining me. This is Real Estate Rich. Today, I wanted to show you how to fill out a purchase and sales contract in the state of Florida. So in other words, if you're looking to purchase a property in the state of Florida, and you want to use a standard contract, this would be the contract that you would use, and this is how you can fill this contract out. If you're looking to get a copy of this contract, you can simply contact me. Uh, my contact information will be uh, at the end of this video. And or you could search Google for a, a Florida FAR bar, F-A-R-B-A-R. So let me explain to you a little bit about uh, this contract here. And, and then I'm going to show you how to start filling it out. So I assume if you're watching this video, you're somewhat new to real estate or you have some curiosity on, on how to get started and you want to know how to fill out a contract. So I made this video for people who are pretty much just getting started or they have an immediate need on, on how to fill out a purchase contract. So what you notice is I'm going to do a couple of purchase contracts. The first purchase contract that I'm going to do is called the as is purchase contract okay <clears throat> so this is in other words a way of you telling the seller that you're buying the property as is where is so if they have furniture left over maybe even if they have like tenants in the property that may not be paying or squatters uh you know if the lawn is really high you know, basically you're agreeing to buy the property as is. I'm going to go over some of the actual specific nuances and agreements that you're agreeing to when you buy the property as is. But I want to point out to you that there are two different types of contracts. There's just a regular contract for residential contract for purchase and sale. Okay. And then there's an as is contract for purchase and sale. And the as-is contract is more aggressive. Uh, it's more favorable towards the seller. And it means that the buyer may have to take on more responsibility, more uh, issues with this property. However, if a buyer signed a contract with a seller that was not an as-is contract, that buyer would have other uh, remedies and would have other promises from the seller, other guarantees from the seller that would make sure that if certain things were wrong with the property physically or certain things were wrong with the property uh, with title or permits or violations or things of that nature, that the seller would be obligated to try to fix them or to fix them, or the buyer wouldn't have to buy the property. When a buyer and a seller sign an as-is contract, the seller in most cases will not be any under obligation to try to fix any problems or to attempt to fix any problems. So the as-is contract is a more aggressive contract for a buyer to use, and it usually favors the seller more than the buyer. This is something that a buyer would use with a seller to be aggressive, be more aggressive than another buyer, be more aggressive than another offer to show the seller that, hey, you realize that the property may have some issues and isn't perfect and you're okay with that and you're willing to show them that you're okay with that by signing an as-is purchase contract. Okay? Now, the reason why they call this a FAR bar is there's something called the Florida Association of Realtors which would be an acronym for FAR, F-A-R, Florida Association of Realtors. We also have this organization in Florida called the Florida Bar. And that organization regulates the lawyers in the state of Florida. It issues their licenses and it regulates their behavior. Uh, <clears throat> so what we have here is we have the Florida Realtors and the Florida Bar. And they got together and they wrote this contract together. So this contract has been approved by the Florida Association of Realtors and the Florida Bar. So I mention that to sellers at times if they're unfamiliar with real estate and they don't understand this contract. I say, listen, this is a standard contract. This contract has been approved 
and designed by the Florida Realtors and the Florida Bar. So this is the most standard contract and the most uh, government-approved contract that there is. And it also states right here on the front that this is an as-is contract. So right away, if you know those things, you could put a lot of sellers' minds at ease on the paperwork that they're, they're signing or reviewing by letting them know a couple of these fun facts right off the bat. Now, <clears throat> the seller's name. You're going to need to fill in the seller's name here. Some people have done things like owner of record. This is something you can get away with, but also if you end up in a litigation with your contract, the owner of record is going to be something that is going to cause you problems in enforcing this contract. So how do you find out what the owner's name is? Obviously, you can ask them and they can tell you, I am the only owner uh, and this is my name. However, uh, you need to verify this information. You know, you cannot take the seller's word for everything. So how do you find out the owner of a piece of real estate? Every state is going to be different. Some people have comptrollers. Some people have tax assessors, property appraisers. You're going to need to find, in most cases, your local property appraisers or property controller in your county or your parish, so to speak, and you are going to need to type in the address of the property to locate the seller. So for example, I am going to type in an address of the property. So what I did is I went to my local property appraiser here, Broward County Property Appraisers. Usually most of the good websites on the homepage have a property search button somewhere on this side, somewhere here, or, or, or you know somewhere in like the first paragraph or, or box or so. So I'm gonna hit property search. I'm gonna search by address. So this is a property that we own here. So we got the owner of record. The property owner would be Wholesale Home Sales LLC. So I am going to insert this as the seller of the property. Now, the buyer of the property is going to be whatever name or entity you choose to buy under. Um, you may be buying under your personal name. You may be buying under a corporation. So this is where you put your buying name. All right, now the address of the property, you're gonna be putting here where it says street address, property description. So we already know the address to this property is gonna be this address right here. In this case, they call it the site address. So now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna cut and paste this into the section here for the address. Now, you're gonna also need to know what county your property is in. I assume you're going to know what county your property is in. If not, you can use Google to type in the address and then you know do research backwards to locate the county that the property is in. Now, this is a tax ID number here. This is a number associated with most properties that the government uses to identify the property, similar to a social security number, so they can assess and collect taxes from you. This is our tax ID or property ID here in Broward County. And this is where it's located. This county has not very descriptive descriptions. In other counties, it's a little bit more descriptive what all of these numbers are. <clears throat> so I'm going to insert this in here. Now let's talk about the legal description. I've seen uh, products like ReFax. I have seen mentors that have insisted on their students using that program and or just general investors, wholesalers, using programs to write up their contracts. And what you'll see in some of these contracts is, uh, you know, something like, uh, you know, legal description as it appears in public records. All right. This is completely incorrect and wrong. And if you do not have a legal description in your contract, your contract is basically almost unenforceable. Okay. In, in, well, the reason why they call it a legal description and, you know, when you go to court, it's a court of law is because 
the the powers that be have designed the system to whereby the legal description is more important than the property address. The legal description, without a legal description, we're taught as realtors, you do not have a legally binding purchase contract. So it's extremely important that if you plan on having a legally binding purchase contract, you plan on having a contract that is enforceable, possibly even recordable, you're going to need to have a legal description entered in there. Not only that, but you need to make sure that the legal description is correct. I have given banks trying to foreclose extreme amounts of hard times because they have spelt words wrong in their legal description. They had a missing legal description, a partial legal description. The legal description is very important. I think you get the point. But don't let a, a mentor or a software program have you sending out offers that do not have a legal description. A, anybody who knows what they're talking about will look at your offer as a bullshit amateur offer who does not know the difference between uh, a, a legit contract and, and a BS contract. So when I see a contract come through with like legal description as it appears in public records, I already know this person's lazy. They don't know what they're doing. They're not really serious about the business. And all of those things are a turnoff to somebody who's trying to do a serious deal with a, a serious buyer. So this is going to include uh, things that are included with the purchase of the property. So for example, stoves, refrigerators, dishwashers, ceilings, fans, etc. Now, if there's other property you know, a gazebo in the backyard or, or a hot tub uh, uh, under a covered porch or something like that. Other property that you want to include in this purchase, you can type right here. So other property goes here, okay? Now, if you want to list property uh, that's included in the purchase price but has no value to the sale, so, for example, maybe if it comes up missing, somebody steals it, it's not going to really affect the purchase price of the of the sale, then you can have those items that are uh, included in that put here. Okay, so now we're going to move on. We're getting to the money part, okay? So this is where you're going to discuss with the seller how much money you're going to pay, how much deposit you're going to put up, when you're going to give the deposit, where the deposit is going to be held, if there's going to be an additional deposit, and how much money you're going to need to come up with at closing minus your deposit. So to use a round number, let's just say we're going to purchase this property for $100,000. Okay. The seller and I have agreed on an initial deposit of $5,000 and it can either accompany the offer, meaning like when I sign the contract, I'm going to be giving them a cashier's check to give to the title company or I'm going to be uh, at the same time, you know, providing the deposit. The other one is, is to be made within. So I like this option a lot because you can get into a legally binding agreement and then not have to put up the deposit immediately. So if I could get away with three days or five days or whatever, I will try to get away with as much time as possible. Now, bear in mind, if you are in a competitive market and there are multiple offers, you may want to do it accompanies with or to be made within one day or something of that nature. You don't want to you, you want to keep in mind that you may be competing with other offers and the more aggressive your offer is, the better chance that you have of getting it accepted if the seller understands the nuances of the difference of why your offer is more aggressive than the others. So just bear in mind, you know, your competition on a particular property, but if there is not a lot of competition or no competition, then obviously, you know, it serves you to have as much time uh, to make your deposit as possible. Now, usually your escrow agent is going to either be a lawyer's office or a title company or a mix of both. So 
My title company would be Citadel Title and Escrow in Coral Springs and their address. Now, here's another thing. You need to make sure that you put the address and the name and the information of the escrow agent. If you do not put the information into the contracts for the escrow agent, again, you're going to have yourself in a situation where the contract is not fully binding. In other words, uh, nobody knows where the escrow deposit is supposed to be, uh, meaning that a buyer, although you may have sent them wire instructions and they may have sent a, a deposit to a title company, okay, and you know and I know and everybody knows that deposit was for this deal, if you do not have an escrow company listed or the correct escrow company listed on this contract, if that buyer decides that they do not want to buy that house anymore and they want to get their deposit back, their lawyer is going to have a, a legal ground to request that deposit back from that title company because there's no contract stating that that escrow company is supposed to be holding that deposit for this particular contract. And, and, and the reason is because you didn't put the escrow company here or you didn't put the correct escrow company here. So in other words, the, the, the buyer and their lawyer could say, well, that deposit's not for this deal. There, there's no, my buyer, my client didn't agree to use this escrow company for this transaction. There's no escrow company listed here. How can you say that that deposit's for this deal? There's no escrow company here. Then they're going to quote some type of administrative code, and then your lawyer is going to realize that they're right, at least for the most part, and not want any problems, and most likely you're, the buyer's going to get their deposit back, or you guys are going to you know, possibly stand to get in trouble. So... You need to make sure that you put in the escrow company's information and that the information, you know, is correct. Okay, you could put in their phone. You know, I would say the only thing you can really uh, get away with is not putting in a fax number so long as you put in the phone and the email. All right. So moving on, uh, sometimes uh, what you can do is put in additional deposit. So if you're negotiating with the seller and they're like, oh, I want a 10 grand deposit, you could say, all right, Mr. Seller, I'm going to give you $5,000 now and then I'll give you another $5,000 in 10 days or in five days or when my inspection period is up, however many days that is. This is also a way that you can negotiate with the seller to leave a smaller deposit now and the rest of the deposit later or, you know, negotiate a larger deposit if you can put up less deposit now and then you just put up more deposit later. So if you're going to be putting in an extra deposit later, this is where you would put in how many days after you... Uh, after the effective date, meaning after you guys, the date that you guys signed the contract, that would be the effective date, unless you guys specify the effective date as otherwise. Uh, but the effective date would be the date you signed the contract. So how many days after the effective date are you going to make your second deposit? If you leave this blank, it's automatically 10. So, you know, uh, if, if, if your people aren't paying attention and you just leave it blank, you get 10 days. All right. So, uh, This is the amount of financing that you're going to be getting. Now, I deal with cash buyers and cash deals, and, and, and even if they're getting hard money, everybody writes it up as cash. So I am going to skip this part because I am really not catering towards people who are writing contracts that are, are getting mortgages for like retail buyers. However, uh, if you were, this section is, is more self-explanatory, and it basically says express as a dollar amount the loan amount. So if you're going to be getting a loan amount, you know, this would be like the, where the loan amount would go. 
So then the last number that you would end up with, with down here would be your actual amount of cash to close, how much cash the buyer is going to need after their deposits and after their loan amount. But we're going to skip this for now. So moving on, time for acceptance of offer. So if I send a seller an offer, my offer, me in particular, my offers are usually good for a very long time. But other people who are, uh, you know, not be having the time to be patient or wanting to negotiate a bit more aggressively can put in here, today is June 18th. So I may, I may write in here to the seller, hey, Mr. Seller, my offer is only good till June 20th. So if you want to play games and entertain other offers or, you know, do an open house this weekend and try and get more money or try and get better terms or whatever it may be, by all means, please do so. But my offer is only going to be good till June 20th. So if you decide that you want to come back to me on June 25th and say, you know, uh, I decided I want to go with your offer. I may have already found another house. I may have already spent my money. Or at this point, you know, I may have better opportunities. And for me to take on your house, you know, you would have to lower the price a little bit more. You've also let me know by coming back to me after the uh, my my date of acceptance that I was probably your best offer. So now I have the leverage in the negotiation because I've already walked away once. And now, you know, I may tell you I need a better price on the house or I'm going to walk away again. So the effective date just lets the seller know that, hey, listen, my offer isn't good for 20 years. You know, if you think you're going to shop it around, uh, you know, you may not have an offer by the time you're done shopping it around. Now, the other way to do this is to, you know, have the effective date be very far into the future. So it lets the seller know like, hey, you know, I'm here for the long term. If, if you want to sell it this month, this week, this year, you know, my offer is good when you're ready to take me up on it. All right. So the closing date is the date that you plan on funding the transaction and the seller plans on signing over the house to you. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't negotiate with the seller that, hey, Mr. Seller, you're going to leave five or $10,000 in escrow at the title company. And upon you moving out of the property, you know, 30 days or 60 days after the closing, you'll receive that five or $10,000. And if you don't move out, then I, as the buyer, will receive that five or $10,000. So the closing date is the date that you plan on funding and they plan on signing the house over to you. But you may also be negotiating things after the closing date, like when you're going to actually take possession of the property or when certain furniture is going to be removed or things like that. So the closing date is something you can negotiate with your seller based on how you know quickly they need to close or want to close or what you know imminent you know event may be occurring that that is going to dictate how quickly you need to close, such as like a foreclosure sale date or something of that extent. So, you know, picking your closing date is something that you want to discuss with your with your seller. Now, what you also notice here is there are going to be spots for the buyer and the seller to initial on every single page here. So as the buyer, you want to write your initials here and you also want to make sure that the seller initials every single page. It's not good enough that you, they just sign the last page of the contract. They need to initial every single page all right so moving on uh this video is just about how to fill out the purchase contract okay i will go through the actual contract in another video what all of the additional terms and paragraphs mean that you don't actually have to fill out so again you know coincidentally we were just talking about occupancy after closing. So this is the box that you can check if you're going to be buying the property with tenants that are subject to a lease or buying the property with squatters or people who are just living in the property uh, or, you know, the owner and you have agreed that, you know, they're going to be able to stay in the property for some period of time after the closing, you will want to check this box. Okay. Uh, so everybody's in agreement that, you know, you're going to be taking the property subject to occupancy. Now, you also may want to write in additional terms or change the terms of this paragraph, which I'll show you where you can do 
later, okay? Um, again, if property is intended to be occupied by seller after closing, see Rider U, post-closing occupancy by seller. Rider U is a fancy term of just saying an addendum, a standard addendum. You don't need to use Rider U. You can literally write into the special clauses or write on a blank piece of paper or write on what's called a residential addenda, which you can find on Google, and I can also uh, supply you with as well. And you can just write in there, you know, the seller and buyer agree to allow the seller to stay in the property up to 30 days after closing. In return, you know, the seller will pay this amount of rent or will deposit this much money in escrow. And, you know, it'll discuss who gets the money if, you know, the, the timeline for move out is met or is not met. You know, there may be other terms of that agreement, like the buyer can start to prep the outside of the house for, uh, you know, rehab, maybe, you know, start to spray, spray, pressure clean, spray paint, you know, things of that nature. Uh, start landscaping, you know, maybe if they're going to replace the roof, start on the roof, you know, you, you can decide you know, basically almost anything uh, that you want to put in that uh, agreement, you can put in there. So I want to just point this this paragraph out to you and let you know that it's here. Uh, and, you know, have you guys read, read through it uh, so you understand, you know, what you're agreeing to when you check this box. And if you don't fully agree to it, just understand that you know you can write up your own agreement or add into the special clauses section of this agreement what terms for you know occupancy after closing you are going to agree to and allow. Okay, so this part of the contract is where you can make the contract assignable. Now, if you want to learn what an assignable contract is, how to fill out an assignment agreement. Uh, I will put a link in in the uh, comment section or, or, or whatnot below this video uh, where you know you can find out what an assignment of contract is, what an assignment agreement is, and how to fill it out and how it all works. I will give you a brief uh, explanation here. Uh, but if you're really interested in assignable contracts, I would refer you to my other videos on assignable contracts. I would also refer you to emailing me directly at learnhow at getrealestaterich.org. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer your questions, supply you with any documents like, like assignables, assign, assignment agreements and things like that. So, what is an assignable contract? Well, the easiest way to look at what an assignable contract is, is an assignable contract is basically the pieces of paper that make up the contract. That is your contract. What an assignable contract is, is basically a contract that can be transferred to another buyer. In other words, the other buyer can jump in your shoes, take your place in this contract and become the buyer. So in other words, you can transfer the ownership rights. You can transfer the obligations of the buyer, the ownership rights of the buyer to another person, to another entity of yours to another company. Now, why would anybody ever want to sell their contract, assign their contract to another buyer? Well, one reason may be money. You may want to make money, make a living. You may want to be a wholesaler. You may decide that this property is not for you. It's a good deal but you don't want to buy it at that time because you already have too many rehabs going. You don't have the money at that time. 
you don't want to spend the money at that time. You don't like the neighborhood. The property is too far from your house. Or you're just a wholesaler and that's what you do. You flip houses. In other words, you flip contracts. You assign contracts for a fee. So if I had this property under contract, which I do right here, if I had this property under contract, so to speak, for $100,000 and I went to a cash buyer, I went to an investor, I went to a realtor, and I said, listen, I have this great rental property you could buy and you could buy it for $105,000, okay? And let's assume they went out and they looked at the property and they said, you know what? I like this property. I will pay you $105,000. Well, if I'm buying this property for $100,000 and they're willing to pay me $5,000, that is a $5,000 spread, a $5,000 margin, or and or a $5,000 profit, okay? So now that you have this $5,000 profit, uh, what do you do with it? You know, if you don't have $100,000 to buy this house and close on it and pay the closing costs and then resell it to this guy, which if you had to do that, you'd only be making like one or $2,000 because all of your profit would get eaten up in closing costs. So the way you can sell a property, so to speak, sell the rights of this contract to, to buy the property is by doing what's called an assignable contract, whereby there is a piece of paper called an assignment of contract. You can take this assignment of contract and fill it out, just like I'm showing you how to fill out this purchase contract, and in essence, what that assignment of contract will do is for a fee of $5,000, you are going to assign, sell, transfer, all of those words being interchangeable in this case, you will sell, assign, transfer your rights as the buyer to somebody else. So now they become the buyer. They become the person that has to come up with the $105,000. And when they come up with that $105,000, $5,000 is going to go to you as the assignor, the person assigning the contract, the person selling the contract, the person transferring their rights in that contract to the new buyer. So you can check this form okay a buyer may not assign this contract if this box is checked right here okay unless you're doing something called a trust deal which if you want to know how to assign a contract without the contracts being assignable for example may not assign the contract you would have to do something called a trust deal Again, you can look at my videos on what a trust deal is, and I will teach you how to use a land trust and teach you how to do assignments on contracts that are checked may not assign this contract. I will show you the trick, the loophole around it. Now, I don't want to confuse you. I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. But if you do encounter a contract that is checked, may not assign this contract. Guess what? That means you can't assign this fucker. So what that means is you are going to have to either do one of three things. Number one, uh, get your seller to agree that the contract can be assignable. Slash, you can change the buyer's name, which you can do this in an addendum. Both buyer and seller agree the contract is now assignable. And or, you know, the buyer may uh, replace the, the, the current entity with another buying entity. All right. The other way would be using a land trust and a trust deal. That would be way number two. And the third way would be uh, selling your LLC. So if I own an LLC called Rich Buys Houses and I'm the only owner of that LLC, I could sell that LLC. So in essence, if, if you, your name is, is John Doe and 
I want to assign this contract to you as John Doe, and I'm buying it in an LLC, and my contract is not assignable, well, what I would do is instead of assigning you the contract, I would just sell you my LLC. So if my LLC is the entity that is buying this, and I sell you, your name goes here, LLC, I sell you the rights to that company, in essence, if you own the company, now you own the contract. So those are three ways to get around a contract that is check may not assign this contract. Number one, just get the seller to agree to allow you to make it assignable or change the buyer's name. Number two would be doing a trust deal. And number three would be selling your LLC to the actual person you're trying to sell the property or sell the contract to. Now, if the contract is signed, may assign and thereby be released from further liability, that means that you can assign this contract. If the buyer that you assign it to does not close on the purchase contract, you as the assigner, you as the guy selling the contract, assigning the contract, have no liability. They can't sue you. They couldn't keep your specific deposit. They don't have any further liability. Now, if you check the box, may assign but not be released from further liability, that means if the person that you assign the contract to doesn't close on it, that the seller could potentially come after you legally. In other words, they could keep your deposit. They could potentially sue you for specific performance, meaning sue you and get a judge to demand that you buy this property, that you come up with the money somehow to buy this property. So obviously, if you're doing a contract and you're assigning it, the best box to check is may assign and thereby re be released from further liability. If worse comes to worse, you know, you can assign this, you can do may assign, but not be released from further liability. And depending upon many variables, even if your, your buyer doesn't close on the transaction, you know, chances are the worst thing that's going to happen to you is you're going to lose their, your deposit. Okay. So moving on uh, to the financing section, we're going to be talking about, uh, how you're gonna pay for this property. It's very simple. If you're not getting a loan from a bank and you're doing cash or hard money, you're simply gonna check box A. The buyer will pay cash for the purchase of the property at closing. And if you don't, there's no financing contingency to the buyer's obligation to close. So you can obtain a loan for the property if you want to. But if for whatever reason you can't get a loan, you're gonna to have to come up with the cash. And if you can't come up with the cash and you can't come up with the loan, you are going to lose your deposit and be liable uh, you know, to still have to potentially purchase this property because this is a legally binding agreement. All right, again, don't forget, every page has to be initialed by the buyer and the seller, okay? So, Moving on, uh, okay, so closing costs. This, this discusses what the actual closing costs are and what's to be expected, okay? These are what you're agreeing to pay as the buyer, okay? And these typically are the costs that are being agreed to pay by the seller. All of this is negotiable, okay? The seller may tell you, hey, I want you to pay my, my documentary stamps. You know, the seller may tell you, hey, listen, you know, you buy your own title insurance. It's insuring your title after all. Yeah, I'm choosing the title company, but I still want you to pay for your own title insurance. You know, so this is what you're gonna agree to. This is what would be considered somewhat standard. Uh, you know, especially if this seller, if especially if the seller is choosing the closing agent, 
then it would be somewhat traditional in South Florida and, 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 and some of the counties that the owner also that picks up, the seller also picks up your title insurance and like the title search and the lien search charges as well. Now, if the buyer is going to choose the title company, it might be more traditional for the buyer to uh, pay for the title insurance and pay for the title searches. But, you know, there's no law about it. So really, it's all negotiable. There may be tradition, uh, but there's really no law. So all of these things can can truly be negotiated. But if you're going to sign this contract as it is, you know, be un, be of the understanding that in an expectation that these are going to be the costs that you are going to end up paying. If your seller wants to know what the documentary stamps are in the state of Florida, it would be the purchase price multiplied by 0 .007. All right. So this is title evidence. This little box here has helped a lot of people. Because a lot of times people leave this box blank and man, this used to be five days. It would say if left blank, then 15. And in, in, in other words, 15 days. So let's just say you are a wholesaler and you're trying to wholesale a deal. You have it under contract. And just for whatever reason, the closing date comes and you are not ready to close. Maybe your buyer backs out. Maybe you're just short on cash at the moment. Maybe you just don't have the fucking thing sold yet. So now the seller's like, and their lawyer's like, you got to close today or we're going to liquidate your deposit. I say, oh, really? I pull out my contract. I say, listen, it's, it's interesting, you know, theory that you have. Uh, but this says that you're supposed to give me title evidence 15 days, uh, you know, before the closing date. Because, you know, you guys left this blank. Or maybe you filled it in and you put 10. But listen, you guys only gave me the title insurance two or three days ago before the closing. So legally speaking, I would have another 12 days to close or I would have, you know, another 10 days to close or whatever number is filled in here because this contract that's legally binding that your seller agreed to said that you would give me the title evidence 10 or 15 days before the closing date. You only gave it to me three days before the closing date. So the way I interpret the contract is the closing date would now extend to make this timeline effective. In other words, hey, if you gave me the, the documents three days before the closing and I and you were supposed to give it to me 10 days before the closing, I would say that the closing date would extend another seven days to make this part of the contract accurate. You know, I, I wrote it in there for seven or 10 days because this is how much time I need to verify and research your findings. I don't give a shit if your title insurance says that they're going to insure it. I have had title insurance claims in the past based on people's mistakes for, uh, uh, on their title insurance claims. And then it takes me a year to go through court to settle it. So yeah, I wrote it this way specifically and I'm not closing because you didn't give me the title evidence and the title commitment 10 days or five days or whatever before the closing. So I don't have to close right now because you didn't meet your timelines and obligations, okay? So that's an argument that you can have. I'm not saying you're gonna win it, but it's something that you know you can stand on legitimately because they didn't meet their timelines and obligations, okay? Now, it, it, they may have excuses. Well, we signed the contract 10 days ago and, you know, it wouldn't give us time to give it to you 10 days before closing if, you know, we only had 10 days to close in the first place. Well, Mr. Lawyer, I guess you should have caught that when you were representing your client and taking their money that you knew what the fuck you were talking about. Or, well, Mr. Seller, I'm sorry you didn't understand what you signed, even though at the end of the contract it says if you don't understand it, to consult a lawyer to, to before you sign it because it's a legally binding contract. So, you know, if people end up playing games with you, that's one way you can fucking play back. So, check one. As we kind of just discussed a moment ago, if the seller designates the closing agent, they'll pay for the owner's title insurance and certain policies. Uh, and this says the buyer shall pay for the premium of the buyer's lender's policy, not the buyer's owner policy, but the lender's policy. And if the buyer designates the closing agent, the buyer is going to pay 
for the their title insurance and their owner's policy and charges for the closing related to the buyer's policy like a title search or a lien search and things like that. So again, this is all negotiable. You do not have to check any of these boxes. You can write in the special clauses or write in an addendum, you know, who's picking the closing agent and who is paying for what specific closing cost. This contract is written to be somewhat based on tradition and, and the status quo, but by all means, you can choose who pays any of these closing costs and you can write that into an addendum or the special clauses. You can also pick one of these boxes and, and make it easy on yourself uh, and say, hey, seller's choosing the title company, seller's gonna choose for title insurance and title charges, as well as the charges that are listed above, or you could say the buyer's choosing the title company and the buyer's gonna pay for their title insurance and title charges, as well as the charges listed above. And this that will make it really clean and really clear for everybody, but you know, if you're dealing with professionals or sticklers, who are nickel and diming, then you know you may need to write up something more particular and more special to make everybody you know happy in their nickel and diming efforts. Again, initials, don't forget the initials. Okay. This right here is a Miami Dade Broward Regional Provision. Uh, you know, this is something you can check as well. I don't ever use this uh because it's 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 not explanatory enough and I just find that it's it leads to more problems and more gray areas than it, it, it does good so uh, in more confusion especially if you're not a pro or you're not really understanding what all of it means when you read it I would stay away from this box okay and if people you're doing business with check it uh, and want you to initial that they want to use it this way you know fuck that Okay, unless they're giving the house away or you really understand it and everybody has discussed it and, and maybe, you know, re-solidified what it means, uh, then I might go for it. All right, so uh, moving on, you know, this talks about home warranties. Some people have home warranties uh, that, they're, that they're selling with the property. And so, you know, this just discusses if the buyer is going to buy one, if the seller is going to provide one you know, what the costs are associated with that home warranty. Now we got special assessments. Special assessments may be from the government. Maybe they are building new sidewalks and uh, sewer lines out in front of your house or in the neighborhood. Maybe they, maybe you live in a homeowner's association and the homeowner's association is gonna do a special assessment in addition to the monthly homeowners association fee, the homeowners association says we need to upgrade the roof on all of these properties. Uh, you know, the insurance says that it's that time we can't get cheap or new insurance until we replace all the roofs. So in order to replace the roofs in this condominium association or townhouse association, or in order to repave the roads or, you know, install a security gate or whatever it may be, we're going to be doing an assessment. The assessment's going to cost everybody, you know, $300 a month for the next two years. And so this just discusses if the seller is going to pay uh, that assessment in full prior to the closing, if they're going to just pay the money that's owed up until the date of the closing for that assessment, uh, you know, it just discusses who's going to pay the assessment, how much of the assessment they're going to pay, and what timelines are being used in regards to who is going to pay that assessment and how much of that assessment they are going to pay. Typically, uh, you know, most real estate deals don't have any assessments. I've done hundreds of deals, and to be quite honest with you, I, I can't recall a deal that actually had an assessment uh, at the time of closing. But when you're buying townhouses and condos and things that have homeowners associations, uh, it's good to ask if there's any assessments now or if there's any assessments in the future that are coming. If you don't know at the time of signing the contract and the seller doesn't know and they want to look into it, you know, you can, uh, you know, write into the special clauses or do an addendum you know, that discusses that, you know, 
uh, you guys will come to that agreement later or, you know, whatever it is that you agree, if no, if nobody's sure on the facts and hesitant to uh, check one of these boxes agreeing to something before they do their research, you know, in most cases, it's good to do the research ahead of time. But, you know, if you want to lock the seller in and then have this be something that you guys negotiate once you each find out the facts, you know, by all means, uh, you know, you can do that as well. So, uh, you know, moving on, uh, this discusses if the property is within a flood zone in that, you know, the buyer may terminate the contract by delivering written notice to the seller within a certain amount of days after you sign it. Uh, so, you know, you sign the contract, you find out, oh man, you know, the property's in a flood zone, it's in a FEMA flood zone or, or, or other type of flood zone, and uh, you didn't know that, you don't want to be in a flood zone, so, you know, you can tell the seller, hey, you know, I just want my deposit back, I don't want to buy in a flood zone, okay? Uh, you know, if you know it's in a flood zone also, you know, going into it and the seller doesn't, uh, you know, this is another way to leave yourself some outs in the contract. Again, don't forget the initials. Okay. So kind of moving down. This is where the as is clause, as is contract clause really comes in to play. So I'm actually going to read through this with you, and I suggest that you take some time reading through it as well. Uh, so property inspection and right to cancel, property inspection and, and, and right to cancel. So this is your inspection period. This is one of the most important parts of the contract, especially if you are an investor or a wholesaler. So this basically discusses that you have a specific period of time where you can look over the property. You can look at the roof, the plumbing. You can look at anything to do physically with the property or things that may affect the property, like permits, uh, violations that may not be liens or have fines, uh, and anything to do with the property. You know, you're, you have as the buyer full authority to decide whether this property is up to your standards or not within the period of this inspection period. So let's say you have a 10 day inspection period. That 10 days can be used to inspect that property inside and out and do other types of research or qualification of that property for your acceptance of the property uh, to purchase. Now, within that 10 day period, let's assume that you decide you do not want to buy the property anymore. Maybe you found something about the property that you don't like. Uh, maybe it's a repair. Maybe it's a permitting issue. Maybe it's an addition that wasn't permitted or an open or expire permit. You know, maybe it's just a, a, a violation. There's no fines, but you don't want to buy it with the violation and the seller doesn't want to fix it. Maybe you're a wholesaler. Maybe you took 10 days to try and sell the property. You sent out postcards and bandit signs and did some colds calling and, you know, did some email and Craigslist and Facebook and, you know, you showed it to some buyers and, you know, you just can't get the property sold, uh, you know, at the price that you have it at or at a price that makes you any money. So you decide you're going to go to the seller and cancel the purchase contract within this inspection period. You, you know, you can cancel the contract. You would sign an addendum or, you know, a cancellation. It really doesn't have to be a formal document. It can basically just say, you know, the buyer and seller agree to cancel the contract and return the deposit to the buyer. So one of the most important parts about canceling the contract within the inspection period is if you do that, you will get your deposit back, okay? Assuming the seller agrees to sign the cancellation, which they are legally obligated to do if you are canceling your contract within the inspection period. Now, let's say you go over the inspection period. That means your deposit is hard. That means your deposit is non-refundable unless for whatever reason the seller cannot m live up to their obligations under the contract. But assuming the seller is living up to their obligations under the contract and the closing date has arrived and they're ready to close and they're offering you what they promised to offer you at closing and you do not close for whatever reason except 
you know, they have not done something that they're supposed to do in the contract, uh, then if that time comes and you're supposed to close and you don't close, you can lose your deposit. You can also get sued uh, for not closing on the property. Uh, and that is what the inspection period is all about. It is a time where if you are a wholesaler, you can use that inspection period to market, try to resell the property, get illegitimate inspections, use them to negotiate the purchase price further. And or, you know, you can always go back to your seller and say, hey, I need more time. You know, they may say, well, why? And you can come up with all the reasons why. And, and, and you could just tell the seller, it doesn't really matter why. I'm just asking you for more time. You know, either you want to give it to me or you don't. You know, it's up to you. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, committed to the deal still. You know, I've got time and money put into it as, as you do. I just need another five days. You know, do you want to give them to me? And if they do, then, you know, you write up an addendum, uh, you know, or you write into this contract that, you know, the seller is giving you an additional five days, you know, beyond whatever specific date, you know, uh, the inspection period would have ended at. Now, you know, let's go through this. You know, the buyer shall have 10 days after the effective date, which remember is the date that both parties sign the contract or the, the date that the last party signs the contract, which to have inspections of the property performed as the buyer shall desire during the inspection period. If the buyer determines in the buyer's sole discretion, the buyer's sole discretion that the property is not acceptable to buyer, buyer may terminate this contract by delivering written notice of such election to the seller prior to the expiration of the inspection period. If the buyer timely terminates this contract, the deposit shall be returned to buyer. Thereupon, the buyer and seller shall be released of all further obligations under this contract. However, the buyer shall be responsible for prompt payment for such inspections for repair of damage to and restoration of the property resulting from such inspections. Now, folks, I, I've never in all the hundreds of deals I've done had anybody damage anybody's property or have to pay the seller any money for an inspection. For repair of damage to and a restoration of the property resulting from such inspections and shall provide seller with paid receipt for all work done on the property. Uh, and basically, even if the contract's terminated, you still owe the seller the money. Unless buyer exercises their right to terminate the contract herein, buyer accepts the physical condition of the property now, here's where the as-is part comes in, folks. Here is where the as-is part comes in. The buyer accepts the physical condition of the property and any violation of governmental, building, environmental, and safety codes. So, listen, man and girl, if you sign a purchase contract that is an as-is purchase contract and there ends up being a code violation, a building violation... An environmental violation, a safety code environment, a safety code violation, or some other issue, maybe like an open permit or an expired permit. Okay, you are obligated to buy the property with that violation of governmental, building, environmental, or safety code restriction or requirement. That means if you sign this as is purchase contract and you wait a week and the lien search comes in and the lien search says that there's a violation for a addition without a permit and a violation for, uh, you know, uh, the roof and it needs to be replaced or a violation for, uh, whatever the situation may be you are going to be obligated to buy that property with that building violation, that code violation, because you did an as-is contract and you agreed in the inspection part of it that once the inspection period is over, that you're going to agree to buy it with any violation of, of code, okay? Now, there may be a nuance to this. If their violation has created a lien on the house, so, for example, the government came by the house that said your, your lawn is too long 
and let's just say you know you didn't comply with them and you didn't mow your lawn and they started to fine the homeowner you know, $100 a day. And now the homeowner goes to sell the house to you. You sign this as is purchase contract. The inspection period has passed. So now your deposit is non-refundable and you've agreed to buy it with code violations. But the lien search comes in and there's a code violation, but there's a fine. And there's a $25,000 fine on the house from this code violation. And now the fine has turned into a lien. It's an actual lien on the house. Now, this purchase contract uh, may require that the seller gives you clear title. Now, if there's a lien on the house, although it's a code violation lien, it's still a lien. You may be able to back out of the contract and get your deposit back because the violation is also a lien. And you didn't agree to buy it with liens. You still want a clear title. But you said if there's a violation on the property and, you know, there may even be fines, $5,000 fine, okay? As long as that fine is not a lien on the title to the property, you still may be obligated to buy it with that violation and with that fine because you've signed an as-is contract. Now, if that violation has turned into a lien, you may not have to buy the property if this contract is saying that the seller still has to give you clear title. This is something that you may want to question me about, and you can reach me at learnhow at realist, getrealestaterich.org. And uh, that is your inspection period clause. That is your place where you fill in your inspection period, the amount of days it's going to be. And some people also write in the special clauses that the inspection period is in business days, meaning Monday through Friday, you're not going to count Saturdays and Sundays. So this will give you like a little bit of extra time, uh, you know, to do the inspections or to market the property if you're trying to wholesale it. Okay. So if you have any questions on the inspection period, on how this inspection clause, uh, you know, correlates to an as-is contract, how this inspection clause correlates to you buying it with violations or liens, you know, if you didn't understand or you want clarification or you feel that some parts of the contract are, you know, contradictory, by all means, you know, hit me up and I'd be happy to explain it to you. Uh, again, don't forget your initials. All right, so, you know, kind of moving towards the end of the contract. Now, mind you, I'm skipping a lot of the contract because this video was about how to fill out the contract, not how to know every single part that's in the contract and what it all means. I will do another video that literally goes through each section of the contract and gives you my two cents on it. It will be a long and boring video. But for those of you who are really interested in studying the contract and knowing it inside and out and getting some guidance on what it all means or getting some reassurance on it meaning what you think it means, then, you know, that would be a video for you to watch. Okay, so the rest of this contract is pretty much going to be a lot of disclosures and a lot of things that may or may not apply to you. What the lawyers and, and the, the realtors did when they wrote this contract is they wrote it to be cookie cutter. So they thought of every single thing that could happen in a real estate transaction and wrote this contract to apply to all of that. So although I would say, you know, 70% of the things written into this real estate contract won't apply to most real estate deals in case you end up doing a deal that is a 1031 exchange, uh, you know, they have a clause in here that discusses, you know, that 1031 exchange. And in case you are doing a FERP to closing, which basically means, you know, you own a property and you live outside of this country, you're not an American citizen and the money is going to be sent to you outside of the country, 
uh, after your closing, you know, so say like, for example, I've done a deal like this where the person lives in Brazil, they're a citizen of Brazil, they own a house here in, in Miami, they sell the house, the money's going to get sent back to them in Brazil, not being an American citizen, you know, there's going to be certain tax withholdings that that person is going to need to be aware of that, hey, you sell the house for a hundred grand, you know, you think you're going to get a hundred grand, you're not. The U.S. government is going to require that the title company holds maybe $20,000 of that back so that you could pay uh, taxes, you know, on your capital gains to the United States government. So even though, like I say, 90% of real estate transactions will not be what's called a FERPTA transaction that I just explained, they have this section in this contract because it's a cookie cutter contract meant to cater to everybody's needs uh, at the same time. Even though you may not have this need in your contract, it's here just in case you do have that need. So like I say, most of this will not apply to most of the real estate deals that you're actually doing. Now, this is a list of standard addendums, okay, that realtors have access to and that you could probably find a lot of these on Google. So these are just addendums that let's say I was selling a property with a homeowners association. I would attach a homeowners association addendum to this contract and I would click this box so everybody knows that this homeowners association addendum as part of this contract, it was included in this contract and everybody signing this contract agrees that they got a copy of this homeowners association addendum. If uh, you know, we were doing an appraisal contingency, or if this was a short sale, basically there's specific cookie cutter, pre-templated, pre-worded addendums that you can use and attach to this contract to say, hey, this is a short sale. We want you to know, you know, that this is how the timeline of the short sale is going to be. This is what the buyer's obligations are and the seller's obligations are for this short sale. And everybody understands that if the seller doesn't get the short sale, they're not gonna be able to sell the property to the buyer. So instead of trying to write that in your own terms, if you're, if you're uh, you know, not really well versed on, on how you want your short sale to go, they've created a cookie cutter addendum that you can add into your contract that will basically be like a contract, fill in the blank where you can fill in, you know, how you want to uh, have the timelines and obligations of the short sale be agreed upon between all parties. So as you can see, there are a lot of templated cookie cutter addendums that you can attach to a contract, or you could just hit other and, you know, write in your own addendum. Okay. Uh, and that's typically what I do. I write up my own addendums. Now, scrolling down a little bit, I call this special clauses. You're going to, you, you remember throughout this uh, explanation of how to fill out this contract that I said special clauses. A special clauses would be another name for additional terms. I still call them special clauses because in my mind, they're special clauses more than they are additional terms. So this would be where you could write in your special clauses, both a buyer and seller agree to whatever. Agree to allow seller to remain in property up to 30 days after close. You know, uh, you may say number two. Uh, you know, that, I don't know why I did that. Well, anyways, I, 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 I'm not going to uh, go through this because I'm already messing up and, and, and I think you get the point, but this is a place that you could list any additional terms, any clarification. So for example, you may say, inspection period is calculated in business days. 
You may, you know, so anything you want to write in here, additional, you write in here. If it won't fit here, you know, then you can just do an addendum, a residential addendum, and, you know, fill out the addendum, which is very simple, uh, and, you know, use that addendum instead. Uh, you know, it, it, sellers can sign this offer and then check this box and it'll say seller rejects it. You know, seller counters buyer's offer. Uh, this is more for the seller to fill out. And this is more people doing like traditional real estate will use those boxes. But, uh, you know, if the seller rejects your offer or wants to counter it, they'll probably express it to you in a different way than checking those boxes. But just be aware that, you know, those are there. And then, you know, this is one of the most important pages as well. This is where the buyer will sign and the buyer will print. I also think that it's intelligent to ask the buyers and sellers to print their name because I don't know who's signing this. You may scribble something and then, you know, try and back out of the deal and be like, well, I didn't sign it. That's not my signature. You don't know who signed that. You can't, you know, you don't even know what they wrote. It's just some scribbles on a piece of paper, you know? So I would always suggest buyers and sellers, you know, more the opposite party. So if you're the buyer, you want the seller to do this, will print their name or names, you know, next to or under their signature, as well as don't forget that they date it. And then they can put their address here for purposes of notice. Most notice nowadays will be sent through email and it won't be an actual uh, address. So, you know, I, I feel like that they can or you can put an email address there, you know, a, a, as well as a, a physical address. Uh, so, you know, if you are using a realtor and they are going to be representing you in the deal, whether they're collecting a commission or not, you know, if they're going to have some type of legal obligation to you in this transaction, you know, this is where you would fill in the realtor's information. Uh, you know, this would be the listing agent's information. So the seller's agent, and this would be the buyer's agent's information here. And you fill that in if there is none. And you just want to avoid any uh, problems, you know, you just put none, you know, all over. So nobody can, you know, fill it in later or, you know, try and play any of those kind of games. And then even though this is the signatory page, you still have to initial. All right. So this is how you fill out an as is purchase contract. Now, guess what? This is the same way you also fill out a regular purchase contract a non as is purchase contract. The difference is in a regular purchase contract, when you get down to the inspection period clause, you are going to have a lot more freedom and leeway as the buyer. You're not going to be obligated to buy it with violations and open and expire permits and safety codes and restrictions that may not be up to date on the property. You know, when you sign a regular contract, in in most cases, uh, because those contracts can be, you know, uh, altered as well, you know, you, they can have con, they have, can have paragraphs added and taken out of them. But in a standard Florida far bar purchase contract that is not as is, you are going to have ways to get out of that contract if there are violations, whether they have liens or fines or not. If there's violations, open or expire permits, uh, you're going to be able to get out of that contract because it's a non-as-is contract. So how you fill out a non-as-is contract is going to be the same way that you fill out a as-is contract, but you just need to be aware of the difference between an as-is contract in between a non-as-is contract so you don't get yourself into any trouble uh, as a buyer or wholesaler. Now, also, if you are a wholesaler and you are going to be doing an assignment of contract, in other words, you're going to sign this contract with the seller, you're going to have a fully executed, fully initialed contract, and you're going to put up a deposit, so now you have a contract to buy this house. If you are going to assign this contract, you are going to fill out an assignment agreement that your client who's going to be buying it from you on the wholesale flip and you as the assigner 
of this purchase contract, you're going to assign this purchase contract to somebody else, okay? Now, keep in mind that that buyer you're assigning this purchase contract to, they are going to be getting assigned a as-is contract. Now, I've had situations where I will assign an as-is contract to a buyer, they will sign the assignment agreement, they will put up a deposit, and then they will come back and say, oh, well, I'm not buying it with that expire permit, I'm not buying it with a violation, but you got assigned an as-is contract, so you are, you know? so." It's important that you as a wholesaler know what your buyers are on the hook to do. And obviously it's important they know what they're on the hook to do. Sometimes buyers will get assigned an as-is contract and they think they know what as-is means and they don't. Or they know what as-is means and then they try and play dumb or stupid or leverage like, oh, I'm not closing, I want money off, even though they got assigned an as-is contract. So you have to be aware of people playing that kind of game and be aware of really what an as-is contract means for you as the buyer, for you as the wholesaler, for you as the assignee, the person getting assigned the contract. It's very important you understand the nuances of an as-is contract. Thank you for tuning in and hearing me out and, and taking your time to learn how to fill out an as-is purchase and sales contract in the state of Florida. This is Real Estate Rich. Please follow me on Instagram at Get Real Estate Rich. Follow me on my YouTube channel here. Please subscribe right now. And if you have any questions or comments, leave them below and or hit me up for a personal one-on-one -on -one email or free mentor session at learn how at getrealestaterich.org. Thank you for tuning in, and I wish you luck in your real estate career in entrepreneurship.